I want to say a quick hi to those who are joining us at our online campus, who are listening in the podcast or the video. Welcome to St. Andrews. Glad you're with us. And for the last eight weeks, we have been going through Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. And this is a church that Paul dearly loves. And as the letter closes, Paul just wants to say thank you. This community has always been dear to his heart, and he's always been close to, to its heart. And they've, they've supported him, they have prayed for him, they have held him up in thought. And, but then there's something happens where the circumstances force them to lose contact. And for about two years, nobody knows where Paul is. He just kind of falls off the radar. But then one day, word reaches the Philippians about the fact that he's in prison, and, and they don't waste any time sending one of their own to, to go, and he, he brings them greetings and good word and, 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 and care, and he, he looks out for him while he's in prison, and Paul says that this is like springtime for him after a long, dark winter. It just it, it breathes life into him, but he wants to make it very clear that it's not the gift itself that he's happy about. It's what God has done in the hearts of those who, who, who have just welled up this generosity. And so he, he ends this note with a, a letter of thanks with, for their friendship, for their love, for their care. Uh, and he wants them to know that while things have been really difficult on this road, he has learned something really transformative in the journey. And so if you're able, I'd like to invite you to stand as we read God's word from Philippians chapter 4 verses 10 through 23. Paul writes, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yet, it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I, am, I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you have sent. They are a fragrant offering an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, and then he kind of tacks on this little uh, P.S. in his own handwriting. Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you their greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, one of the subtexts of modern life is that uh, we're always a bit anxious that uh, somehow we're going to end up trapped with ourselves. Uh, so we have this kind of, this deep, you know, sort of uneasiness that, uh, this restlessness that wells up inside of us that uh, tells us that, you know, we've, we feel like our circumstances are keep us from living the life that we are meant to live. Or if it's not our circumstances, then it's our jobs or our spouses or our families or our school or, or whatever it is. And we get to think that if we could just make a few changes here and there, then we would find contentment. So what uh, about you? What do you want to change? Maybe you want to get in shape. Or, or maybe you, you want a bigger house. Or maybe just a bigger closet would, would be all right. 
or maybe if it's not a bigger closet, maybe you think that the, the problem I have is that I just I need to actually clutter, declutter and, and simplify my life. Maybe you just need to figure out the secrets of financial peace. Or maybe you want to live a life free of anger or, or free of resentment or you want to live with more self-confidence and more spontaneity. Or maybe it would just be a huge win for you if you could wake up in the morning without having multiple body parts ache. <laughs> well, our, our culture just kind of feeds this unrest. It, it, with a few well-placed you know, words in a search engine, you too can find the product or the professional that will help you make every single one of these changes and your quest to find contentment. And sometimes you don't even have to search for it. It turns out advertisers have figured out how to sell the, the white space on a web page so that it comes at you when you're doing, you know, stuff like preparing for a sermon. Apparently, apparently Google thinks that I need a new car and it thinks I need John Patterson to sell it to me. <laughs> we can't escape this kind of constant visual pollution of billboards or ads or, 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 or commercials coming at us. And, and even our emails kind of have this, this thing that's, that fills them up with spam, with all kinds of products that promise to make us better or smarter or, or you know, more attractive or newer or some way. So here's just a few of the subject lines that got caught in my spam filter this week. Have bad credit? Apply for a gold MasterCard. <laughs> Try this weird biblical trick for reversing hair loss. <laughs> Dr. Oz shows you how to melt the pounds away. Earn your seminary degree online in a year. <laughs> and that one kind of stings because I spent three years and I moved all the way to New Jersey. Uh, want a better way to fax? Yes, it's called email, thank you. And then my favorite one, take this pill to become the man of her dreams, which I take to mean that it's gonna make me a better listener, it's gonna make me more attentive, make me wanna hang out and do housework a lot more. Otherwise, we gotta get that girl some better dreams. Well, most of us realize that these kinds of promises, they, they, they belong in the junk folder, but at the same time, we can't escape these kind of nagging voices that tell us that life would just be so much better if we could find the one needful thing to bring us to contentment. And if we're going to find something like contentment, so the thinking goes, it's going to come as some sort of escape from our present circumstances. And that's going to be the thing that helps us to live the lives we really want. And this message gets drummed into us all the time. Uh, for a while, my kids got hooked on playing the game of life. Remember this one? Well, there comes a time early in the game where you get, you know, dealt out these cards. And then between that and the little spinny wheel at the center, uh, the circumstances of your imaginary life just kind of get handed to you. And they tell you, you know, when you're going to get married, what kind of job you're going to have when you have kids. Uh, and you just kind of keep getting cards throughout. Lose your job. Oh. Win the lottery, yay! Up and down, up and down, all until you end in this magical land called retirement. And then life ends. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what this game is teaching my children, but it doesn't matter because we actually don't always make it past the first couple rounds. Um, they just end up dumping the, the cards back in the box. Because you can already tell that based on the cards that they've gotten, that this life is not going to lead to contentment. As adults, we usually try to make sure that we get the right cards from the very beginning. So we focus on the career card or the house card or the family card, and, and, and we, we try to arrange our deck in such a way that will lead to a strategy of contentment. And then we fixate on trying to maximize the cards we've got. So we tell our kids that they've got to take the right classes to get into the right college so you can land the right job. And of course, all of this is very exhausting. So we try all sorts of coping mechanisms like therapy or CrossFit or juice cleanses. And we read half a dozen self-help books to answer the burning questions that keep us up at night. Maybe we even try to move to a new town or we take a new job. 
And we realize that, you know, we're thinking, if I, if I just had this card, or if I could just get rid of this card, or if I didn't have to spend so much energy dealing with other people's cards, then maybe that'd be it. And maybe those things help for a little bit. But sooner or later, we realize that we're still the one who's spinning the wheel, and we're still playing the game. And sometimes we wonder if we wouldn't just be better dumping everything back in the box. And maybe that's why you're here at church. Maybe you're thinking, if I just, you know, add church to my deck, somehow contentment will come out of that. When the Apostle Paul wrote his letter to the church at Philippi, he was writing to a church that had its own share of difficult circumstances. He was facing great hardship and financial distress. And as he's thinking about them, he kind of goes on this journey of reflecting on his own life story. He's faced more than his share of difficulty. I mean, he started out his life struggling against the church, and then God knocks him down and calls him to struggle for the church. And if you read through the book of Acts, you see that he's actually been in three shipwrecks he's, as he's crisscrossing across the empire, planting churches. And all the while, he's dealing with the authorities from Rome or the authorities from Jerusalem who either want to throw stones at him or throw him in jail. And then he's got this thorn in the flesh that he asks God to take away. And, and he spends all his time, it was hard work getting these churches off the ground. And then he finds that he's spending all his time writing letters to keep them faithful to the gospel because the circumstances of these churches just keep drawing him back into their orbit. I mean, even the Philippians who fill him with so much joy, they have this, this struggle that is going on between you two women, Euodia and Syntyche, and we don't ever find out what it's about. And then, at the end of all this, he's in jail. He's got a death sentence hanging over him. And he doesn't know whether to gear up for the fight of his life or if the fight's just going to come to an end. I imagine there were more than a few circumstances that made him think, I just want to take all these cards and dump them back in the box. And yet he says to the Philippians in the midst of all of this, I have learned the secret of being content whatever the circumstances. It's like he's hitting the pause button in the middle of his thanks to, to, to just take a look inside these events and these circumstances, these times of joy and pain, these times of plenty and need and freedom and bondage. And, and he's inviting them to see that in the midst of all that's going on around him, God is actually doing something profound inside him. The center of his life is not whether he's in prison or not. It's not whether he has plenty or not. Those are just the cards he's been dealt. They don't say a thing about him. Because the center of his life is who he is in Christ. And what Christ is doing for the world through him so I've got to ask you, what is at the center of your life? Well, it takes a while to, to, to sit with that and to, to think about it, to, to kind of peel back the layers of our lives. And, and that's why Paul doesn't say, I know the secret. He says, I have learned it. He says, I have learned the secret of being content. It's something that you kind of grow into. And most of us, we don't, we, we just want to know the secret, right? <laughs> we don't want to learn it. We live in a world that promises us results now, but the thing is that there are some kinds of knowing that just can't be handed down. There are things that you have to come through experience. I mean, I think about raising a child. I mean, you can, you can read certain books, right? You can... You can get some tips and some techniques, and, and sure, all that's good. You're, you're going you're to hear some wisdom from people on that, but most of the things that draw you to those books in the first place is that you just, you just want to know that you're going to get through it. Like, you just want to know that you're going to survive this, this whole child-raising experience. But more than anything, when they hand you that child for the first time, we realize pretty quickly that 
There can be no other way of knowing than discovering along the way. You have to do it to know how to do it. It's this, parenting is this form of initiation. It's like being hazed, but with a little less sleep. And so Paul is saying that the journey has been like that for him. He's created this curriculum out of the pendulum swings of his life, and he's, he's found a kind of strength that doesn't come from running away from your circumstances, but that actually comes from standing firm and leaning into them. It's interesting, the, the word that our Bibles translate as contentment, it actually is a word in Greek that means self-sufficient. As in, in the midst of these circumstances, I have learned to be self-sufficient. And this word doesn't appear anywhere else in the New Testament. It's a favorite, though, among the Stoic philosophies that would have been popular at this time. And the Philippians would have understood this to describe someone who, through self-discipline, has gained this kind of mastery of their emotions and has detached themselves from their external circumstances. And they built up within themselves this kind of reservoir of the soul that allows them to take whatever life can throw at them and just roll with it. And we know all about this. I mean, we're baptized by our culture into this narrative that says that struggles are meant to be overcome. You got to keep a stiff upper lip. And when things head south, you just got to put your head down and power through. And this is where we spend our time focusing on building and accumulating the right cards. And so we try to live out our self-sufficiency by, by building up our deck through hard work, just piling on the achievements, or, or, we, or by constructing our identity, by focusing on the choices that we make. Or maybe we just simply hoard all of our cards by accumulating as much as we can in this kind of desperate attempt to forestall the eventuality that we might be brought low. But then we get the cancer diagnosis. Or we get the letter from our employer that says that promotion you were in line with for, it just isn't going to happen because we've been acquired. And actually, you may not even have a job. Or you get that phone call that a loved one is at the hospital. And then suddenly it seems as though your carefully arranged game of life just can't hold so now that Paul has their attention with this image of self-sufficiency, he takes that image and he flips it on its head saying, I can abound or I can be humbled because of the one who gives me his strength. I know how to cope with whatever happens because I am in union with the one who humbled himself, who left the abundance of heaven to enter into my circumstances and to show me that they're not the final word. And this verse, I can do all this through Christ who strengthens me, is, is not a call, it turns out, to put yourself at the center of your story to go out and conquer the world. It's to discover that at the center of your story is Christ, and he is going to supply you with the strength to endure when the world conquers you. It's this promise that God will be with you, and he will give you the strength to do the things that he has called you to do. And friends, this is good news because it means that we can abandon all our attempts at self-sufficiency and draw strength from the one who is all-sufficient. Writing from a prison cell in Nazi Germany, Dietrich Bonhoeffer stumbled upon his own secret. He wrote this, I believe that God will give us all the power we need to resist in all times of distress, but he never gives it in advance lest we should rely upon ourselves and not on him alone. Until we give up our attempts to trying to find contentment in ourselves or in our circumstances, we're never going to be open to receive the strength that Christ offers. And it turns out that some struggles are not meant to be overcome, but they're meant to change you along the way. We know that Paul didn't make it out of prison. 
And yet, because he found Christ in the most important struggle, the one that was going on in his own heart, he was free. It turns out that the secret of contentment is not by fixating on whether or not you have been playing the right cards. It's to find your strength and your center in something other than what you've built for yourself. It's to find it in your identity in Christ the Savior. To realize that he has taken all of your cards and he's given you his. We have been united with Christ And that means that everything that he has to offer has been given to us already. And so we are free to claim his life as our own and to move into new patterns of being. A number of years ago, I was invited to be with a friend as she received a diagnosis of stage four liver cancer. It had metastasized and she was given six months to live. And Susan could have spent the the next six months just cursing the cards that she had been dealt. But instead, she spent the next year and a half, pretty much like she spent the previous 46 years, receiving each day as a gift. I would go with her on occasion to get uh, infusions to keep her body hydrated. And to anyone who would come near, she would, in this beautiful and winsome way, ask them how they were, let them know that God loved them, and offer to pray for them. And I will never forget the privilege of watching her pray God's peace over her nurses who were bawling because they realized that this was the last time they were ever going to see Susan. And she's praying for peace to come over them as her body is giving out and that her soul is being made strong. And and don't misunderstand me. There were hard times and there were seasons of pain and there were many tears. She did not want this and God did not do this to her. But God did something pretty amazing in her. A little while later, when we began to plan her funeral, I asked her, what kind of verses do you want read? Without hesitation, she said, if we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we belong to the Lord. And I thought, of course. Because like Paul, she had found the secrets that Christ had already gone before her. She belonged to him. And the life that he offers, he gave it to her in return. Friends, I'm not saying that this is easy, but what I am saying, I am here to bear witness that an ordinary life can be made powerful in the strength of Christ. And this happens to be exactly what the world needs from us. After all, if we're united with Christ, then that means that his goals, his mission, his vision become ours. And that means setting our goals and our vision aside and and having our vision refocused. After all, Paul did not learn this secret just so he could be happy in himself in prison. His circumstances were that he was in prison, but he still had a calling. He was part of this great drama of bringing God's mercy and the justice of heaven And saying that it's near to earth. And these last verses remind us that many of the imperial guard came to know Christ through him. Friends, you have a calling too. You have a calling to reveal the the nearness and the availability of God's kingdom in your homes, in in your schools, in your places of work in your own families. And you're going to need a strength that doesn't come from you to take on the deep injustices of this world. That's what your colleagues at work are going to need. That's what the woman down the street whose marriage is falling apart is going to need. That's what the young mom who is in over her head is going to need. That's what your friends at school who, who don't actually think that they have a self apart from their accomplishments are going to need. That's what the neighbor who is paralyzed by fear that all of his carefully constructed house of cards might one day collapse. 
And that's what the person in the pew next to you is going to need. When they realize that the promises or the, the problems and the challenges that they face are just too heavy to take on by themselves. Because they have that, haven't already, they're soon going to find out that all of their attempts to play the right cards and to find the right techniques to just kind of muscle through life on a strength of their own is not going to lead to a place of contentment. They're going to need a center they can hold. They're going to need a strength that comes with all the power and joy that heaven has to offer. And they're going to need you to show them the way. Amen.